So the passage that we're looking at today is our passage from Matthew chapter 17 and following right on the heels of Matthew 16. So we've already seen um, the challenges that Peter has gotten into. I love the book of Matthew. Now, Peter comes forth in all of his boldness and his brilliance, and uh, he constantly is putting his foot into his mouth, and he takes time to take it out and put it in again. So, um, uh, and, and lest we judge Peter too harshly, uh, just remember, he, he got out of the boat and walked on water. So, as impetuous and as, as bold as Peter was, he, he certainly makes some good choices. Uh, in obedience to the Lord, unlike the other disciples. And he was the only one who stood up to defend the Lord. Be as it, as it might, you would say, well, he shouldn't have had pulled that sword. But he was trying to defend his Savior and his Lord. And he said, I will die. And I think he honestly, at that point in time in his life, was thinking seriously, I guess this is it. We're both going to die here. Because he could see the crowd was a little bit bigger than he was. And one sword doesn't do much when you have a whole crowd of people with swords and staves and, and weapons. And so it begins by saying that we, uh, we look at this passage from four uh, uh, little, little kind of points of view. So there are four sections uh, to this passage. Um, and it's, uh, it's really impressive to me that as we look at it, uh, we can learn some things for our own lives. The first section, just to point these out to you, the first section deals with um, the passage, uh, verses 1 right through to verse 3, and it's called the change witnessed. And then we have, uh, after this, we have the challenge of speaking, verses 4 and 5. And then finally, we have the passage called the conflict experience, verses 6 through 9. And life is full of conflict. As much as we wouldn't like it to be that way, life has its conflict. And last but not least, the confusion of prophecy. And I love that part because for a long time, I was convinced as a Christian, my role as a believer in Jesus and a good disciple was to get this thing called prophecy figured out. The confusion of prophecy is what we call verses 10 to 13. So... Uh, we'll try to expand on that as we look in this passage this afternoon. I'm just going to take a moment before we, we further go ahead and just ask God to further bless our time. Lord, you alone are the giver of information, of wisdom. You have given us your word, not that we would just simply touch it, not simply open it, but rather that your word would open our hearts, our minds, and our wills like uh, the scalpel of a surgeon, Lord. We pray that your word will have that full effect on us this afternoon. That as we look into your word, we will learn more of what you've called us to do and be. But more importantly, we will see Jesus. And like those three that were on that mountain, we will catch a glimpse of your glory and go away transformed. Thank you again for this time, and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. This chapter begins with this glorious scene on the mountaintop. What a contrast, because the end of the chapter is Peter catching a fish to pay taxes. And then I got to thinking, wait a minute, isn't that like life? We go from the mountaintop of seeing the Lord and his glory, and we go right back to that earthly world where we end up paying taxes or even going fishing. And I thought to myself, that's the world of the Bible. It's not a fairyland. It's not a myth like the Greek mythology. It's not like the Confucius or the Buddhistic stories that they tell. It's history. His story, history. And it's a beautiful picture. Now, if you're a, a stickler for detail, you will notice that Matthew and Mark state that this took place six days later. While Luke says in Luke 9, 28, it was some eight days later. You go, 
And wouldn't that be called an error date? Or at least they're not in agreement here. Or there were two transfigurations. So how do we look at this? Well, first of all, there's no contradiction. The word of God is clear. There, when you find a contradiction, remember this. The problem is not God. The problem is you and me. You see, we live in the 21st century. And uh, we pride ourselves in this 21st century of being sticklers for minute detail. And you think about it, and that's so true. We're in the computer age. Uh, we're not in the robot age yet, but artificial intelligence is certainly around the corner. You may have already talked to somebody you thought was just a customer service rep, but it was really just a digital computer making the right sounds and sounding as realistic as the most pleasant person you've ever met. If you don't think that's true, uh, just check it out a little bit on Google and you discover that some of the customer service reps you're talking to are the computer right now. So having said that, we live in a world where zeros and ones are very important. We live in a world where, where we're not talking millimeters, we're talking nanometers. We're talking the size of the coronavirus, 1.5 microns. So this day, six days, how do we discover what that means when it says eight days in Luke 9, 28? Well, no contradiction again. The Jewish always used to talk in terms of about a week. And... When somebody said some eight days later, that was their equivalent, the way you would say it, oh, approximately a week later. What that tells you is this. First of all, Luke was a historian and didn't like to be inaccurate. Doctors are like that. Dr. Luke, remember, he was a physician in his day. And he was very specific when he had the facts. But when he didn't have the facts, he would generalize because he didn't want to get wrong. Have you ever had that happen? Of course, we've all done that. You're, you're, you're party to certain information which you know happened. You witnessed it, but you witnessed it from your perspective. And so you can speak of that perspective. But if you're talking about something else that was relayed to you by a second or third party, and they didn't give you all the facts, and they said, oh, it was about a week later, then that's the way you report it. And so, Jesus had promised to build his church in the previous chapter. He promised to, uh, that his, his church was going to be built and that it would continue to be built. The gates of hell would not prevail against it. And now we're going to see a little bit about that coming kingdom, that kingdom that would be built. Where was this happening? We're not real sure, but most people think it was on Mount Hermon. If you go to Israel today, you can visit Mount Hermon. They have uh, ski chalets and snow on Mount Hermon pretty much the whole year long. And so if they went up the mountain for six days, that would be a long ways up. And it might not even have been very comfortable up there. You know, how many times have you and I seen the, the movies reenacting that scene? They don't look cold. They never, ever look like they're in the winter time, but in Mount Hermon, there's snow usually all year long. And so, I got to thinking as I was listening to this passage again, that what Peter responds, his response is maybe actually an act of kindness on his part. Well, let's move on to that in a minute. But first of all, the first three verses the six days that Jesus walked alongside of Peter, James, and John, leading them privately upward to the high mountain by themselves. And he was, now the King James says transfigured, okay? It comes, it's actually the Greek word metamorpho, which means to be like a butterfly, metamorphized. In other words, totally transformed. Some translations use the word transformed, others say changed. This was uh, an amazing, amazing experience. They look at the, the Lord and he has changed right before their eyes. His face 
I'm reading, by the way, from the Greek translation here, so if it doesn't sound like the New King James, it's because I've taken the words and, and gotten the deeper meaning. So his face radiated light like the sun. His garments became white like fire. Now you remember that fire is normally orange. Sometimes it's yellow. But when it's white, it's really hot and really bright. And some even translations say it was like brighter than the, the fuller's soap. That's, a, that's one of the, the translations that adds that thought to it. And so what has happened is they're, they're walking along with the Lord Jesus, three by the way. Now the three that were walking, um, we often say, why just these three? Why not all 12? Have you ever thought of that? Doesn't that seem a little unfair that there was three selected out of the 12? They get to go special places where only they went, no one else. There can be that attitude in our families, uh, in churches. Oh, I'm disappointed I don't get to preach. I'm disappointed I don't get to play the, the keyboard. I'm disappointed I can't play the violin like Becky. I'm disappointed that I that I do this and it seems like a small thing or I show up or I pray and it seems, let me assure you, the body of Christ, of which we are all members, has different gifts, but each gift is infinitely valuable to Jesus. And the valuable gifts that we esteem are valuable, he says, are not the real valuable gifts. Did you catch that? The most important person in this group today may be the person who gets down on their knees and prays and weeps for the unsaved in their community. The most important person in this group today may be the person who has that gift of hospitality or that gift of helps that creates that warm atmosphere so that others want to have the love of God. Do not take back the gift that God has given you. Instead, use it for his glory. These three get to go up on the mountain. And later on, Peter makes it clear that he was really impressed by this time. John puts it this way in John 1.14. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In other words, that experience for him was such that he forever was remembering that moment in time. For John, he could there be on the island of Patmos and say, you know, I'm all alone. All the other disciples have either left for missions or gone into death, into eternity. And I am all alone here solitarily, but you're with me. And like the psalmist David could say, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Your presence, this memory I have of this experience. So Christ laid down this glory in Philippians 2, we describe, describes his laying down of his glory so that he could come into this world and receive unto himself a people by dying on that cross. And so, I'd like to remind us that we too have been encouraged to have a transfiguration experience. This word is used a couple of other places in the, in the New Testament, and I'd like to point out two places where it's used. The first is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, my beloved brethren, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, that you might prove that the perfect will of God. And be ye, the word transformed, transfigured, it is the same word, metamorphized. It means be ye changed by, we call, and then we say by the renewing, the renewing is the metamorphosize of the word. So how do we become changed? Is by reading the word. I'm going to challenge each one today with this question. How much have you read the word this week? How much have you and I allowed 
the word to change our hearts and our minds. Now, I'm a great advent of news. I'm a newsaholic, I think, ever since we got YouTube and we could cast it on and we could watch all these different news channels without having cable TV. It's pretty cool. But if I'm watching the news more than I'm watching the word of God, that's wrong. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing you. And so we need the word of God in our lives. So if we're going to be transformed by his word, we need to have the word of God in our lives to transform us. So how much are we doing that? The second reference is 2 Corinthians 3.18. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 is a, a passage that I think is, is really, really helpful for us. I, I have to say, um, I found this verse very helpful in trying to understand this whole concept of wearing masks. We don't look down on any who wear masks, nor do we elevate those who do not choose to wear a mask. Because this is an individual choice. But look what 2 Corinthians 3.18 says. But we all, with unmasked face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And Paul in this passage is making an allusion to Moses. And he's describing the Old Testament and how Moses, when he went up to experience with the Lord and received the law, he came back down and his face shone so brightly that he had to wear a mask because people could not even see. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing, right? But have you not, and I not met people, their faces glow with the love of God. So much so that when you looked at them, you went, wow, I mean, I, I almost want to put my sunglasses on here. There is a sense where that ought to be happening in our lives with those who do not know the Lord. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves as bondservants for Jesus' sake. This is in chapter 4, verses 5. For it is God who has commanded light to shine out in darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so Paul uses this illustration of how Moses would go up into the mountain and he would come back full of God's glory. And then he says he had to cover himself, but we don't cover ourselves. What we do is we look into the mirror. And what is the mirror? If you look at the word, the word mirror is always used in relationship to God's word. And so the mirror is a symbol for the word of God. And what does the mirror do? It reflects us. And what does the word of God do? It reflects who we really are. It talks about life the way it really is. You know, you know why I can believe the word of God is true, the Bible is true? It's because it doesn't mess around with some of the sin of men and women. It puts it right where it is. When you read the Kings and some of the stuff they did to one another, and you read of the Chronicles and some of the wars they did, you know, 125,000 men, valiant soldiers perish on one day. You think of that, it just boggles your mind. These men and women who were fighting, they were valiant, they were faithful, and they went under an unfaithful cause. They were party to a wrong cause. There are a lot of Christians today, I'm totally convinced, that are a party to a wrong cause. And what that means is they have adopted the world's view, they get the world's information, and it all comes into them, and they think exactly like the world. And we are to have the mind of Christ, but the only way we can do it is by reading God's word and by following his ways. And so it says they saw the change. And I'm asking you today, are you willing to allow God to change you, to be transfigured, to be metamorphosed into his image? The second part is the challenge of speaking, verses four and five. And it says that Peter began to speak and say, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us erect three tents. The word tabernacle means a tent. And I struggled 
I had so struggled with that concept. What in the world was Pete talking about? Was he suggesting, like the Old Testament tabernacle, that he was going to go back down the mountain, get the men from the rest of the group, come up and build three sacred tents so that people could flock to this mountain to see Jesus, to see Moses, and to see Elijah? Is that what he was trying to say? And I was praying about it and asking the Lord, what in the world was going on here? Now, I, I, I'll just give you this interpretation that the Lord seemed to give to me. Sometimes the Lord says, duh, come on, think about this. They're on a high mountain and it's a snowy mountain. You see, we have this picture in our mind that was a really gorgeous place like, I don't know, the Swiss Alps in some of them. The butterflies are flitting around. The meadow is so green. There's no sign of snow. It's a gentle breeze. And then all of a sudden there's this human blast of light and Jesus is brilliant beyond brilliant. Is it possible that they were walking up through a snowstorm, through snow, trudging their way up to this place, following their master, because he said, come with me. I have something to show you. We don't know. But one interpretation is simply this. I've yet to go on a mountain where it's comfortable if there's snow around and Mount Hermon has snow all year long. So as they're walking up, it gets more and more snow, the snow gets deeper, they're trudging. Now you and I, when we trudge through snow up to our knees, we usually have boots on and snow gear on. But remember, these gentlemen were fishermen and they probably had sandals. And they're walking and they have a, maybe a, a robe and maybe they have a staff, but that's about it. And they're walking along and they're going, what, what is the Lord, well, what, where are we going here? And then all of a sudden there's this snowstorm that swirls up around them. And then there's this huge blast of light and they see Jesus and they fall. But of course they fall in the snow. And they're looking up and they're seeing these two, Elijah and Moses, talking to Jesus. The challenge of speaking is this. It's always a challenge to say the right thing. Isn't it not? You go to somebody that's grieving and you go, Lord, I haven't the words to speak here. I have no words to say that can really give comfort, but maybe you could give something through me. Maybe you're going to somebody that's struggling with temptation. Maybe you're going through something that there is a person that you want to reach, but you just can't reach them. It's a challenge. Paul, no, sorry, James, in his little book says that uh, being a teacher is probably one of the most difficult things of all. But yet all of us are called to be teachers, either to our neighbors, to teach them about Jesus, or to, the, or to those in our families to bring them to the Lord. And so, as, they, as the challenge of speaking, we discover that Peter makes this statement. And as he makes that statement, it's a challenge because he messes up big time. And he says, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Well, it's kind of a cool idea that he's trying to protect them from the elements and maybe he wants to expand it. Maybe he was willing to taking off his robe and said, I'll, I'll shelter you from this storm, Lord. And we have two others here. One of Andrew and, 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 and John, uh, they can go, James and John can go, and each one of them can shelter the other, tabernacle them, put, put their robe over top of them, protect them. And of course, he's, he's unique, and a voice comes out of the cloud. And you know, I wouldn't want to speak as loud as that voice because I couldn't. But when that voice spoke, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear him. There they realized that God the Father was speaking to them directly. And he was pointing out something. You don't need to make a tent 
a tabernacle, a place of worship, a place of gathering for these other two and my son. He is unique. Hear him. Hear what he's got to say. Hear him. We know that this is a phrase that the father loved to make of the son. Remember in Matthew's account uh, earlier in Matthew chapter uh, 3, at the very end of the chapter, after he'd been baptized, Jesus came up from the water, and suddenly a voice came up from heaven, verse 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So he has said it at the beginning of the ministry. He is now saying it towards the end of the ministry, and he will say it again in John chapter 12. Well, they, most people don't hear it, but this is what he says. When Jesus says, glorify your son, and he says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And most people thought it was the sound of thunder. Um, a couple of days ago, we really appreciated the, the rainstorm the Lord gave us. We were, our garden really needed the water. I don't know about your gardens, but our garden was pretty parched. And I was outside putting some buckets out and putting some places to catch the rainwater so that we'd have some water for our garden. And uh, my daughter was getting a little worried about dad going outside with an umbrella in a storm and all the other things. And all of a sudden we had a nice bolt of lightning crack down about a block and a half from our house. And it really rumbled, it really roared. And we thought, you know, that that's that was pretty close. That was pretty close. If it got any closer, it would have hit one of our maple trees. But and nevertheless, um, this sound of the Lord, the Father, was probably even louder. And when that sound came, the disciples who were looking before that moment says that they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. And Jesus came and touched them. And it says, when he saw them, they came and touched them and they said, arise and do not be afraid. Arise, do not be afraid. And that's the message today. Arise, let's get going. And don't be afraid. I'm with you after all. I am Jesus. I am the one that is God's beloved son. You don't need to fret. You don't need to fear. You don't need to worry because I'm here. Now, when I was a little boy and I'd walk outside in the dark at night, it could be a little bit scary. And there were two or three times when the, uh, the birds might fly overhead. And I remember one time I was working a night shift at Monteith and I was walking down by the river and we did a couple of trips down there to check on the, the very end of the road, the water pump and the water houses and the sewage treatment plant. And I remember one time and I felt this huge white misty object whoosh over top of my head. And I mean, literally it whooshed and the hair on my, on my arms just went straight up. And then, uh, I noticed something. It was a white snowy owl, a big one, a really big one. And it was flying over looking for mice. And I was walking through the grass and stirring up the mice. And so the Lord said, uh, I'm with you, don't worry. The snowy owl's just to remind you, he's just keeping the path clear from the mice for you. But um, speaking of mice, uh, we had an experience going to church this morning, a little mole. Sometimes we feel like little moles, don't we? You know, this little guy about that long and three, four inches long, maybe. And he's scurrying across to Highway 101. And he, I'm sure he looked both ways before he crossed because there were no cars coming. But what he didn't do is he didn't look up because there was a little falcon. Oh, really? Two of them were on the telephone line watching this little mole. And by the time he got hat right in the middle of the, of the highway, this, I think it was a, Peregrine for Falcon, I don't know for sure, but it was a, a not, not a big one, but a little, but a little guy. And he came down and grabbed that little mole and took him off. And I said, oh, that was, that was, I only see that in normally in nature and science journals and YouTube videos. I've never seen that before. But that reminds me of this. One day, every one of us is going to have the eagle of God come down. 
And he's not going to clutch us to kill us. He's going to clutch us with love and take us home. And he's going to take us away. And Peter and John had a taste of that at that moment. He said, we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. And we have the prophetic word made sure, more sure, 2 Peter 1 and verse 12. And so as we conclude today, I'd like to remind us of this. We have the challenge of speaking, but more importantly, we also have the conflict that they experienced. They rose up, they feared not, and they came down from the mountain. But not only that, we finally have the final part of the message, which was the confusion of prophecy. And lo and behold, we only have one minute to talk about prophecy. So let me just share with you this. The disciples were confused about prophecy. Malachi chapter 4 says that Elijah is coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And it was common knowledge among those who were looking for the Messiah in Jesus' day that Elijah would show up first as a forerunner and he would say, repent, you need to get right with God. And we know who came in that power and the spirit of Elijah and that was John the Baptist. And when they, they asked him, they asked him, what is, who are you? And they probably expected him to say, well, I'm Elijah. But instead he says, no, I'm the voice in a wilderness. Do you know where we are? We're in the Northern Ontario wilderness. And do you know what you and I are? Voices in the wilderness, just like John the Baptist. And we are to proclaim the glories of the Lord Jesus and take the attitude of John the Baptist. He must increase, I must decrease. And not to worry because God has our there was confusion. They didn't know whether this was Elijah or not. And he says to them, oh, well, it, how is it that scribes say Elijah must come first? And these, Jesus said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first. Did you catch that? It's still future then. He's saying he is coming. But then he goes on to say, and I can tell you that Elijah has already come. This reminds us that there is what's called double prophecy. Some prophecy gets to be fulfilled twice in the Bible. And I'll leave it to the Lord to decide which it is. He says this is a double prophecy here. But the point that I'm trying to say about prophecy is this. There's a lot of confusion. Is he coming before the tribulation? Is he coming during the tribulation? Is he coming in the middle of the tribulation? Is he coming after the tribulation? And I say to you today, Jesus is coming soon. Be prepared. I don't have a calendar other than to say all the signs point to him coming soon. A, a statement that says this must be fulfilled. Absolutely not. He said, I come quickly. And you say, well, 2,000 years doesn't seem too quickly there, Dave. And I say, well, just think about it. How long is your life? It's like that, like a little flame, and it's just out, it's gone. That's what James says, what is life? It's like a vapor, appears in the morning, like fog, and then it's gone. So the question is, are we ready? Because our lives are going quickly. Are we ready to meet the Savior? Because he's either coming for us by death, or he's coming for us through the, through the coming called the parousia, the appearing, the, 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 the time that he's, we sometimes translate as the rapture or the meeting of the within the air. But either way, it's coming, he is coming quickly. Are we ready?